Hello again. As we get started, I want to say thank you for being the kind of person that cares about deep, important issues that are going on in the world. I know you could be watching a cat video or the Kardashians, but I'm taxing your mental resources by covering what we're going through, and I really do appreciate that you're willing to watch this. Okay, let's get started. Um, as we do, I want to uh, remind you that there are a lot of other we're going to cover a number of different topics today, and if you want to go back and see more about, say, mobilization, you can see here or here or the referendums, the final day here or the day before that here. And so there's a lot. All you have to do is go back to YouTube and look at Professor Gertis Reviews the News Daily on Ukraine. Okay, here we go. With everything going on, it's almost easy to forget that we're actually still in a hot war. Like, soldiers are on the ground killing and dying still daily. Um, this is the Ministry of Defense. Units are making slow advances on at least two axes east and the line of Oskul and Seversky Donetsk River. Russia is mounting a more substantive defense than previously um, because of their, their threatening the Luhansk region where the referendums were going until yesterday. Uh, and so th that's still going on. And it's almost hard to wrap your mind around with all the other things in the news. The U.S. has announced an, a $1 billion dollar uh, package. Now, this $1 billion package includes 18 additional Heimers. Now, that's great news. It's going to take a while for those Heimers to get there, maybe even a few like years, like into 2023 and beyond. There's 18 more uh, Heimers. There's 16 on the ground right now, if I have my facts straight. Um, and there's other rocket systems that will come, 150 armored vehicles, 150 uh, tactical vehicles, surveillance equipment, communication, all kinds of things. The U.S. is right now in for $16.9 billion. And while I don't like that we're in for that much, I certainly prefer this given the scenario to not doing it. So sometimes, you know, like my, when my car breaks down, I have to pay to you know, have things restored. This is that kind of scenario. It's not optimal, but it sure beats not doing anything about it. The Nord Stream blast could herald a new phase of hybrid war. So if you're not paying attention to this, the Nord Stream pipeline, there was a big explosion yesterday or the day before or something like that. I don't remember exactly where. Uh, and so the Nord Stream pipeline that shoots gas uh, under the Baltic Sea to Europe kind of blew up somewhere at a certain point And uh, now everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else. Norway's prime minister had said its military will be more visible at oil and gas installations across Europe because like, hey, if they're going to be attacking something. Well, they, we don't want to attacking our energy infrastructure. Large amounts of gas has been pouring into the Baltic Sea. Um, seismologists recorded explosions in Swedish and Danish waters under where uh, uh, under the Baltic where the pipeline was. The German defense minister, Christine Lambert, said the presumed act of sabotage in the Baltic Sea pipeline has again made clear how reliant we are on critical infrastructure. Now, the, the question is, who did it? Like, uh, uh, the Russians are blaming the Americans. Um, the uh, different countries are blaming different places. And so was it the Ukrainians? They probably don't have the ability. Was it NATO? Well, NATO is probably not trying to get into a hot war with, with Russia, at least, at least not over something like that. Um, and was it Germany? Germany is dependent on the Nord Stream, so they're not doing it. Was it England? They're probably not trying to tick off Germany and their EU allies. So was it Russia? Well, it's their pipeline, but they're the ones that have been blackmailing. So <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've been the one saying, well, we're going to cut off your pipeline. And so, yes, it would be like self-sabotage to blame someone else. I, I don't know who it is, but that's what's going on. Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Russia's possible nuclear attack does not stop you, uh, Ukraine in defending its territory. Again, Russia's been nuclear blackmailing uh, for the entire time. Uh, and and I, I love this uh, this quote uh, by uh, the Secretary of National Security and Defense Council. If there's no response from the world community, NATO countries to such audacious attack, like if, if something does happen and God forbid it happens, it does not mean that we will not defend our land. No one can stop us, neither Putin nor his troops. So what he's saying is, even if there's a nuclear attack, we are still going to continue fighting. Now, that's kind of hard-headed, but why? What's going on? Well, these guys have a lot to be hard-headed about. So there, we just have, we just got through the sham elections, and I talked about this extensively yesterday, where, you know, hey, 98, 99% of the vote is, is pro-Russia. Like, 
They could have written the articles about what the vote tally was going to be before the election, and we all know it. Okay, so Kiev said on on September 28th that Moscow orchestrated votes. We know that there are they are null and worthless. And the EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell said uh, these are illegal annexation votes and they're falsified results. This is another violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity amid systematic abuses of human rights. Now there are systematic abuses of human rights, and we're going to go to that next. Now, but in eastern Ukraine, Donetsk region, 99.23 percent of those who came to the polls voted. What? <laughs> 99.23 percent voted for russia really like mariupol is in donetsk and they voted they, they they had their their whole lives destroyed and they voted for this 92.4 percent and again i made this clay case in yesterday like sometimes dictators overreach because there's no check of reality to keep them from overreaching. So uh, 97% in Crimea, according to the election returns in Crimea uh, in 2014. And so, no, we have to do better than that. Uh, at least make it realistic and show like, you know, it was conflicted, but 63% of the population was for it. That's, that's a simple majority. That's a, a super majority. Let's, you know, that's what it is. No, they're not doing that. Okay. Here's what I was just talking about. After destroying Mariupol, Russians claim its residents voted for annexation and mobilizes them to fight in Ukraine. 99%. So there's only 1% of the city of Mariupol that after their homes and relatives and whatever else is destroyed are anti-Russia. Uh, Russia has not even waited for voting to end its sham referendum to claim huge support for joining Russia. The surreal nature of this supposed referendum is particularly clear in Mariupol. After several months of Russia's relentless bombing and shelling of the city, Russia is claiming almost 100% support from surviving residents from joining a country that destroyed their homes and killed members of their families, neighbors, and friends. One of the reasons why Moscow has organized these sham elections was that undoubtedly to force forcibly mobilize Ukrainians from occupied parts of Ukraine, including Mariupol. And so that's what's going to happen next. So 99% of the people in Mariupol that, you know, the Russians did this to their town, then voted for referendum, knowing that they would soon be mobilized to be cannon fodder to fight the Ukrainians. That doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. Um, mutilated bodies and Israel. here's the other thing that's really motivating and why you're saying even nuclear weapons won't stop us Mu uh, mutilated bodies in Isium mass graves and other atrocities are found so they found new burial sites uh, of the 411 civilians in this particular burial site 21 military personnel have been sent for forensic examination they confirmed the majority of victims had died a violent death and 30 showed signs of torture nooses around their necks hands tied, some had broken legs, gunshots. Um, so that's what's motivating them. Uh, they found when they're, uh, you know, going to the police station in, that they that the Russians took over, investigators are examining the police station, torture equipment, electrical cables, gas masks, batons. Um, residents in many cases were abducted or simply vanished from the town. And so this is just in Isium. We know what we saw in Bucha, and we know what we're going to see when we liberate other cities in Luhansk and, and, and in Donetsk and as they press forward in Kazan. So, um, yeah, that's why even a nuclear weapon won't stop their fighting. Uh, sweetening a bitter pill. Now, on the other side, the Russians are running away. More Russians have actually fled from Russia. Now, get this. More Russians have fled from Russia than have actually gone to fight in Ukraine. Like, wrap your mind around that. So when they, there were 75% in favor of Putin's war until it came to them, and then they ran away. Sweetening a bitter pill, Russia offers debt breaks and other benefits to entice draftees. So Russian men are being called up to serve. Uh, and Putin's December 21 decision to mobilize at least 300,000, which which might be a million. We just, we just don't know what's classified. Spark protest around the country, driven by some accounts, hundreds of thousands of citizens flee to neighboring countries. And I talked about that just yesterday. So go over here and look at getting out. Are, are Russian citizens allowed to leave? Watch that and you'll see what I'm talking about here. 
Uh, Russian lawmakers are scrambling this week to pass amendments to widen benefits for those serving. So they're going to uh, increase their salary. They're going to have some debt relief. Uh, and it's still not going to matter because they, they don't want to die. Okay, next. Um, this was really interesting. The UN Security Council members condemn Russia's referendums because there's another Security Council action coming, and I'll show you this. But I just want to, I want you to listen to the logic of the British minister. I queued through the United States one, but I want you to hear the British because they make a great case. To impose so, cost on Russia and to provide historic amounts of support for Ukraine. Any referenda held under, the, under these conditions at the barrel of a gun can never be remotely cl close to free or fair. That's right. And the very idea that a referendum on the fundamental question could be held at three days' notice <laughs> in, in the middle of a war zone is frankly farcical. Yeah. We must all unequivocally reject these illegitimate actions and Russian attempts to illegally annex Ukrainian territory. Nobody. Okay, so, and there are all kinds of uh, countries speaking out against this. Albania and goes on and on and on. I actually looked at the whole list of them. And essentially, Russia is standing alone on this one. Now it's time for fun with Russian state media. Russia issues an emergency call to the UN Security Council. That same council that was just talking about how farcical the elections were. Um, so Moscow is going to request a meeting over suspected sabotage against Nord Stream pipeline. You know, because the pipeline's the issue, not the annexation of millions of humans uh, illegally by Russia in in a war that shouldn't have happened to begin with. But the pipeline, that's that's important. Moscow wishes to call an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council over the provocations at the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipeline that they might have destroyed themselves. We don't know. Um, we're not sure who did it, and it doesn't make sense that any of the other characters would have done it. Russian, American, and Swedish officials all said the damage might have been there as a result of a targeted attack on a pipeline infrastructure. No suspects behind the incident have officially been named, although a tweet from a Polish foreign minister uh, thanked Washington for destroying the pipeline. I mean, that doesn't mean that Washington did it. Um, Moscow, which called the incident a terrorist attack, also named the U.S. a potential suspect, of course. We're also the empire of lies, and we're behind uh, why all these former Soviet unions ran to NATO and that kind of thing. Uh, there has been no shortage of threats from... So from? Okay, come on. You just edit, guys. Edit. From from some uh, Western NATO uh, nations against Russian underseas pipelines. Okay, next RT article. Uh, Russia tells EU to treat US as a pipeline sabotage suspect. Okay, so they're now directly pointing the fingers at us. Maria Zakharova. Now, Maria Zakharova, by the way, if you're wondering, is this lady here. She's uh, the liar in chief over there who's just generally spouting lies, constantly spouting lies uh, about whatever she says. Uh, Maria Zakharova, the diplomat, said, Maria Zakharova has asked who the EU intends to punish with the strongest possible response for damage to the Nord Stream gas pipelines. So wait a minute, are you part of Europe or aren't you? Because I thought that you said it doesn't matter what goes on in, in the EU, you're just kind of taking your ball and going somewhere else. I understand it's still your pipeline, I get that, but now you want the EU to be doing right by you when you're doing what to another country within your... I, it's kind of hard to... Anyway, the diplomat said Poland's foreign minister has already identified the U.S. as a party behind the apparent sabotage. Anybody can tweet about anything. So I don't know that I would take that uh, with uh, anything but a grain of salt. Because the comment on Twitter was, thank you, USA. He described the incident as a special maintenance operation. Um, there has been no shortage of threat from some Western nations against Russia undersea pipelines, particularly the Nord Stream 2. But that doesn't mean that the U.S. did it. And would the U.S. want to engage in a hot war over something like that? It seems somewhat improbable. So now I have a question for you. What am I missing? What What is it that I have talked about that you're like, you know, I watch this stream over here or I listen to this source or I read this article that I don't talk about that I really should incorporate? I'd like to hear from you. Thank you for your time. I, I'm looking forward to reading your comments about this. And uh, thank you for being the kind of person that cares about what's going on in Ukraine.